August ended with U.S. stocks riding a seven-month winning streak. But heading into September, consumer confidence is weakening, economic data showing signs of stalling, and with schools fumbling their reopenings, companies struggling to get their workers back to the office, investors are expressing worries about a potential reversal in the positive economic momentum. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm Romain Bostic. This week, the U.S. jobs report suggests the recovery is losing steam. Special contributor Larry Summers tells us what he sees in the numbers. It's not that employers don't want to hire. That's not what's holding down job growth. What's holding down job growth is, in many cases, they're having great difficulty finding uh, the people that they want to hire. And David Rubenstein discusses his new book, The American Experiment. He says, U.S. democracy is going through a series of major stress tests. Recently, the stress tests we've had have been is significant, and they have, I think, changed the way the country's going to think about our government in the future. Hurricane Ida cut a swath through the U.S. this week, battering its way from the southeast coast of the northeast corridor, causing historic flooding in New York and the tri-state area. The storm left New Orleans without power for days. I think the acute risk to life is done, but in terms of ongoing flooding as well as destruction of property, that's still happening. A CDC advisory panel endorsed the Pfizer-BioNTech coronavirus vaccine. That adds another stamp of approval after the FDA's clearance the week before. The committee decided, though, that discussion of booster shots can wait. I don't think that third doses for healthy people are going to change the trajectory of the pandemic. It's first and second doses that will remove the ability of the virus to cause serious disease and hospitalization. And that has to be our goal. And a 20-year war officially came to a close. The U.S. completed its withdrawal from Afghanistan, with President Biden facing criticism for his handling of the exit but he defended his decision to depart. We succeeded in what we set out to do in Afghanistan over a decade ago. Then we stayed for another decade. It was time to end this war. All right, and always we start this show, of course, with a look at the weekend markets. Of course, stocks did end the week mixed. The S&P and NASDAQ did manage to move higher on a weekly basis. The Dow, though, moved lower. As traders really trying to weigh their next moves, of course, after the jobs report shocked a lot of folks here. Joining us right now, our roundtable going coast to coast from New York, Sarah Hunt, Alpine Woods portfolio manager, and out there on the left coast, Los Angeles, Ken Shinoda, double line portfolio manager, joining us here for the conversation. And I'll start off with you, uh, Sarah, of course, with the caveat that of course, one data point does not a trend make, but 235,000 jobs certainly has to raise some questions. Well, I think that everybody was expecting some sort of a slowdown since we had a we had a script that we were going to get through this pandemic, we were going to have a reopening and everybody was hiring for it. Then the Delta variant came in and changed that. So I think everyone looked at July's numbers and thought, okay, August is going to be weaker, but I don't think that they were expecting it to be that much weaker. And I know that there were a lot of particular things about this jobs report. There was some education jobs that people expected that didn't come in. So we're also going to have to see what September says, but September is likely to be noisy as well as people start to get back to school if they can and people start Start looking for jobs if that's part of the reason it was being held up. Yeah, and Ken, not only did that headline number miss to the downside, there was also a big miss to the upside with regards to that wage growth. Yeah, I mean, what you're definitely seeing is a supply demand imbalance between the job openings. We have, if you look at the JOLTS data, over 10 million job openings relative to 8.4 million or so unemployed. People want to hire, companies and businesses want to hire, but the fear of the Delta variant some pand pandemic-related restrictions, people are kind of hesitant to go into the workforce. So what you're seeing is that companies have to offer more to get uh, potential employees to come back into the workforce. And so you're seeing hourly wages start to sneak up. When you look at some of the data that we saw in this report, Ken, specifically with regards to that wage data, and you overlay that with sort of a stagnant uh, labor force participation rate, do you worry at all about, I guess, what this means for inflation, deflation, or maybe something in between? Yeah, look, uh, different people can look at the data, slice it different ways, and come to different conclusions. I mean, one of the reasons you saw a spike in hourly wages earlier on during the pandemic was that the lower end uh, wages in hospitality and uh, leisure kind of fell out of the workforce, and so you saw a spike there. So there are those that will tell you that uh, these waging increases have things to do with those types of trends, but 
Um, I think there's, you know, pre-pandemic, we had a long era of slack in the labor market. And that's kind of what kept uh, inflation at low levels. Mm -hmm. And the big question now is, is some of that slack permanently gone with certain parts of the workforce dropping out? If you look at the uh, over 55 cohort, uh, that cohort has really not come back into the workforce. And some of them may never come back uh, because of what's going on right now with the pandemic. And of course, Sarah, sort of a lot of the reason why the market, of course, parses what's in this report is more so because they're trying to parse what the next steps are going to be for the Federal Reserve with regards to that taper and I guess potentially at some point with regards to rate hikes. Absolutely. And I think that this is one of the big questions where people were looking at the timing and saying, OK, is this going to push this a little bit further? I think it does. But there were some people who didn't think that we were going to start until December anyway. So it's a little bit I think the taper is going to come. There have been very quick to try to separate taper from rate hikes. I think the expectation will be that once the taper starts, the next thing on the table will be rate hikes. But it really depends on the development of the economy. And to the extent that there's a mismatch between the jobs that are trying to be filled, as I talked to a lot of companies that can't fill jobs on the certain skill set levels, and maybe some of the cha changes after the supply chains have been messed up after COVID for the first time, you're starting to see people open up things in the US and manufacturing that we didn't have before. I think there's a mismatch there. The, re the reaction in the market today, Sarah, on Friday, it was relatively muted. You did see a, a bit of a sell-off in some areas of the equity market, and you saw, I guess, a slight steepening of the yield curve uh, in the bond market here. Uh, what do you think is going to be the reaction? Should, I guess, this type of data become a trend? So we, so we start to get more than one sort of weak data point here. Do you think there will be a significant change uh, in the positioning that we're seeing in the market? Well, I think in the first instance, if you start to see repeated data points that are weaker and it looks like you, the employment picture is starting to really slow down and that's not just a blip because of Delta, then I think that you push out the entire tapering and rate hike cycle. And I think that to the extent that that's good for the equity markets that like low rates on the tech sector and every place else, that the market itself and equities can perform fairly well in that environment. But you do start to see a move around in positioning. Mm -hmm. That should not be so great for the cyclicals. It should not be so great for the, for the companies like the banks that would like a different rate structure than we see today, or at least a little bit of a steeper yield curve. You saw a little movement in that today. But I think that that's, you will start to see some sector repositioning if it looks like we're really seeing a slowdown in growth and it's not just a short-term slowdown. Well, so Ken, what would that mean for a fixed income manager? You know, it's interesting. Uh, when you say the word taper, the initial reaction of most investors is that if they're not going to be buying bonds, then rates should actually be going higher. But if you go back through time and look at what actually happens, when quantitative easing starts, the yield curve actually steepens. And uh, when outside of the um, operation twist, where you saw long-term rates fall, when, uh, when quantitative easing uh, occurs, you see rates rise. And tapering actually lowers interest rates as the market starts uh, fearing that growth will slow without accommodation and or the Fed has their arms around inflation. Uh, the big question to me is, is this, time, is this time different? We also saw, Ken, this week, uh, the dollar weekend. It was down for four straight days, at least as measured by the Bloomberg dollar index. And you really haven't seen any sort of a meaningful move higher or strengthening in the dollar now for at least a couple of weeks here. There's been a lot of talk here about, at least at the start of the year, about the direction of the dollar. And at the end of the day, it hasn't really done a whole lot. And I'm wondering how much of that factors right now into your investment outlook. How much of that are you worried or concerned about? Um, well, from a fixed income standpoint, if you're a dollar-based investor, you're not terribly concerned. But if you're looking at um, you know, emerging markets or other uh, non-dollar-denominated dollar -denominated assets, uh, it's something definitely to take into consideration. The dollar has been going sideways, but I think with the last uh, Jackson Hole, with the Fed basically telegraphing that while they'll taper bond purchases, that they're going to keep short-term interest rates very low, that's kind of in contrast to, let's look at the over in Europe. ECB, a little bit more current concern about inflation. They may hike rates sooner than, they, sooner than we will, which is why you've seen the dollar start weakening. So that, to me, says maybe some of these non-dollar denominated investments may look attractive. Curious to see what uh, Sarah has to say about that. Yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts too, Sarah. Well, it's interesting because for some companies, a weaker dollar is better. And for some, I mean, it's, it, it really depends on the sectors and it depends on where your sales are. So to the extent that it may be an issue for 
some companies to have a weakening dollar because their purchasing power is weaker. It's, it's a, very good for people who are selling stuff in other places because it makes things cheaper for them. So I think we're going to have to see how that goes. I know that Europe looks like they are starting to sound a little bit more aggressive on that. I'm not sure that they really end up in the end can be sort of in the similar position that we're in, but we'll see how that happens because we do have an ECB meeting coming up this week, next All right. week. All right, well, both of you are sticking with us in conversation right now. Sarah Hunt of Alpine Woods and Ken Shinoda of Double Line. Coming up, we're going to have a look here at some of the policy changes being discussed in Washington and how that could impact the market. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm Romain Bostic in for David Weston. We're back with our roundtable. Sarah Hunt, Portfolio Manager with Alpine Woods and Ken Shinoda, Portfolio Manager at Double Line. Ken, I want to come back to you here uh, and really on the idea of what we've heard out of Jay Powell, what we've heard out of the Fed here. A week ago, we were talking about, of course, his speech at Jackson Hole, where he talked about the substantial progress that was I guess, sort of made on inflation and that he saw substantial progress being made, of course, on the labor front. Uh, I am curious how satisfied you are so far with some of the communication that we've gotten out of the Fed and the other policy members. Yeah, a great question. Uh, I was driving over here and I was thinking about the amazing tools that the Fed has created for themselves over the last decade. Uh, I have an analogy about the Fed, you know, called 20 years ago. It was like a two-speed manual transmission. It was either rates low, rates high. <laughs> and now, uh, after a decade after the global financial crisis, you've got quantitative easing, you've got Operation Twist, you've got the, uh, all the programs they can throw out, like TALF and TARP during times of crisis, like March of 2020. They've got the dot plots. And, uh, and now they've got uh, uh, talking of taper. So they have so many ways they can slowly navigate the markets by, and keep confidence by the investment community by slowly either moving the dots, taking away some language around accommodative and taper and so on and so forth. So for now, just look at where the equity markets are and look where the, the calm and the fixed income markets, um, so far they've been doing their job, it seems. Yeah, that proverbial toolbox has certainly been put to use. So Sarah, I want to get your thoughts on that as well. I mean, we everyone's talking about tapering, but of course, you know, as Ken points out, there are a lot of other tools that the Fed has, presumably, uh, to manage monetary policy. Well, first, I just want to say that I love that analogy, and then I have to figure out which what it is now. <laughs> if it was a two-strike engine before, what it, what is it now? I think that there is a lot that they can do. I think that they were forced to do a lot because they couldn't, prior to recent history, we couldn't get a lot of fiscal stuff going, and that wasn't just here. It was in Europe as well. So I think that the monetary authorities have been leaned on pretty hard in this between the financial crisis and then every crisis that's come afterwards. So I think that there are a lot of tools and that makes that question about taper even more interesting because then it becomes, okay, so you could taper and then you could pause for a while too. And I think that that's sort of where the equity markets are expecting, which is why they haven't reacted so badly. And I think that that's, there are, there's more room for them to do stuff than just go in one direction and then reverse and go in the other direction. This, of course, also raises a lot of questions here about Powell's future. Of course, his term is coming up. According to Bloomberg reporting, uh, there is expected to be some sort of announcement about a potential renomination here of Jay Powell by the Biden administration here. Um, there's some pushback as well. Some folks who maybe think that the Biden administration to, should turn to someone a little bit more progressive. I'm wondering how the market would react to a situation where Jay Powell was not in that Fed chair come next year. Well, I think that that would be sort of tricky because I think the markets like continuity in the, in the sense of they understand what's happening, especially after a presidential election. So I'd be surprised if there was that much of a shift that quickly. Ken? Yeah, I agree. Uh, Janet Yellen's already come out pretty positive on, on Powell, and I think uh, steady as she goes right now, given other things going on with the administration, is probably the path they'll take. All right. I want to switch over to fiscal policy because, of course, that's also going to play a big factor here in the Fed reaction function, Ken. Uh, there's $4 trillion worth of fiscal spending uh, floating around out there in Congress right now. Uh, about three and a half trillion of that, some folks think should be put on pause, including Senator Joe Manchin, who pretty much came out this week, uh, telling his party that he's probably not going to support that. Um, Two trillion, three trillion. I mean, right now it seems like, why stop there? Uh, Powell, during the heart of the pandemic, called call March, April, summer of 2020, was pretty vocal that in order to get this economy 
uh, you know, off the ground. Again, we need to have that fiscal stimulus come in. And we, we, we've, we've had it come in. And uh, right now, I guess the, the bigger question for risk markets is, is the market addicted to it? Uh, is the, will the consumer truly rebound or will they continue needing the stimulus checks? Will they continue needing uh, the fiscal support to get this economy continuing on a positive trajectory? And of course, we're having this debate when a lot of those unemployment, those expanded unemployment benefits are set to expire basically the day before Labor Day. Uh, Sarah, there's, I guess, an argument to be made as to how much uh, this type of fiscal spending and these other sort of ancillary types of support are supportive of the economy as a whole. I'm curious as to how supportive you think these measures have been of the stock market, of the equity market, and other financial assets. Well, I think it's been very helpful for the equity markets. I think that to the extent that we're now about to get rid of some of those extended benefits, if you look at what happened in this recent labor report, we had no um, jobs added in the leisure and restaurant industries. I think that's an industry that is still very much in trouble. And I think that that's an industry that still very much could use some support. It's difficult because sector by sector, there are some sectors that do not need it as much. But I think that the market has liked the spending that's come about from people having the excess income. And to the extent that they can't get a job, it's, for some people, it's not excess income. It's the only thing that they can get right now. So I think that there is going to be, that's why I think September and October jobs reports are going to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. And how the, and the other economic data that comes in on spending and everything else over the next couple of months to see how much of an impact that actually had on some of the data. Well, baked into those spending proposals, of course, are some more longer-term initiatives, Sarah, uh, on infrastructure, hard infrastructure, as, weather, as well as sort of a expanded infrastructure-type projects here. I'm wondering that if that money were to actually be passed, be signed by the president, and actually make it uh, into whatever avenues are, are going to be taken into the economy here, whether that changes at all your longer-term outlook, your longer-term positioning within risk markets itself. Well, I think that if you really, we need some infrastructure spending. I think that the recent hurricanes just show that so clearly. And what's happening to New York City with all the flooding show that very clearly. To the, if you get that kind of backdrop for certain parts of the infrastructure series, that's a great place to be. It doesn't change risk appetite longer term as much as a change in interest rates and interest rate structure and global growth would change the risk and the equity picture. But I think that to have an underpinning of some real infrastructure spending that we have been talking about now for a decade and a half and still haven't actually put to work. I mean, you can see a lot of construction happening, but it's not, you're not really hardening out the grid. You're not really doing the kind of things that you need to do if you want to change over from a carbon economy and do some of the things that we're talking about on the ESG front. You really need to do a lot more work on the infrastructure in the United States. And that would certainly put some sectors in a very good spot if you could get funding to do that. Ken, I want to get your thoughts here about the housing market because this has actually been, at least for a while, one of the bright spots here uh, during the pandemic and unfortunately is now becoming one of those parts of the economy that a lot of people are worrying about, the sustainability uh, of the boom in the housing market and, of course, some of the inflationary aspects of the housing market. Uh, how do you view the situation right now? Yeah, I mean, look, the housing market is very strong and it's being driven by a couple, couple main factors. One is existing inventory of homes for sale and new homes for sale. We haven't really been building single-family homes since the global financial crisis. We focused a lot on multifamily. So even going into the pandemic, the inventory of available homes for sale was at historically low levels. Uh, after the pandemic, a rush to you know, flee the cities into the suburbs, and then inventory dropped to even lower levels. New home sales are starting to pick up. New home building is starting to pick up. Um, there is some kind of supply chain issues there related to the cost, you know, the materials, also the cost of land and labor is up. Um, but that low inventory is really what's been driving home prices up, mm -hmm. along with low interest rates. Mortgage rates are at historical lows, and uh, put those two things together, and it's a recipe for higher home prices. All right, we're heading into a three-day weekend, the Labor Day weekend here in the United States. Uh, Ken, post-Labor Day, that was supposed to be the back to school, back to work. It was supposed to be the revitalization of a lot of these business districts. When you look at commercial real estate out there, which has suffered pretty badly during the pandemic here, do you see any sort of hope, at least in the interim? <laughs> yes, I, I, you know, I drove from the suburbs into downtown today. Uh, our offices as well, post Labor Day was the game plan, but with the Delta variant, um, I think a lot of companies are starting to push back uh, that back to office um, uh, uh, effort. And uh, I think that commercial real estate is a very bifurcated market. Certain pockets uh, are very hot. Industrial is like a rock. 
Uh, E-commerce is uh, uh, in demand right now. Multifamily is also largely like a rock. A lot of uh, uh, borrowers making their payments or tenants making their payments. Retail was bad going into COVID. It still has troubles. So really kind of the two, two main spots are the ones that have to do with business-related travel and uh, yeah. the office. Leisure-related hospitality, people want to go on vacation, they're doing okay. But the big uncertainty really is you know, commercial office space and business-related hotels. And really the jury's still out uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's kind of wait and see mode right now. Sarah, do you have an eye at all on what's been going on, particularly in the real estate market, whether it's with the housing market or with commercial real estate, anything there uh, that you've been keeping an eye on? Well, I would agree with the sectors that, that, um, that your other guest just mentioned were very strong. And I think that that's, I think that's something that's going to stay where it is. It's hard to imagine that we're all going to go back to work in lockstep very, very quickly and or that a lot of people aren't going to want to continue to work from home. So I think that the real question is going to stay on that business and commercial sector. And I think, I mean, you can add to that some of the things like business travel on airlines hasn't recovered at all and airlines haven't recovered. So there's a lot of areas that are going to be much more continuously negatively impacted by the fact that where people are more used to working from home and in a lot of in a lot of places, that yeah. means that you've got some areas that are very tricky to figure out what to do with. All right. Wonderful conversation here. Sarah Hunt, Portfolio Manager with Alpine Woods and Ken Shinoda, Portfolio Manager with Double Line. Coming up, a look at the week ahead on Global Wall Street. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Welcome back to Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. I'm Romain Bostic. Time to take a look at what's coming up next week on Global Wall Street. Romain from China will look to trade data to get a sense of how shipping and supply chain shocks may have affected exports. We're also watching for China's credit data. It may show a rebound in August in light of stronger policy support to cushion the impact of the Delta outbreak, which is likely to have weighed on demand for services. So consumer inflation may have eased further last month. We also get a final read on Japan's second quarter GDP and upward revision is anticipated. And on the central bank calendar, Australia and Malaysia are widely expected to keep rates steady. Ritika? Thanks, Sophie. Next week, of course, the big event is the ECB meeting. After we've had some hawkish comments from ECB policymakers, we'll also get a look at the engine of Germany's economy with factory orders out on Monday, then Germany industrial production and ZEW expectations out on Tuesday. Taylor? Thanks, Ritika. Of course, one big thing we're watching is the expiration of some of the extra pandemic unemployment assistance programs on Monday. That extra $300 a week is expiring. Analysts really looking to see if that helps ease some of the labor shortage in the market. Speaking of the labor shortage on Wednesday, we're getting the JOLTS survey data. Remember, in June, we're coming off of a record job openings, more than a million. The job numbers that we're supposed to get next week also expected to show another million job openings workers and employers really here just desperate uh, to close that labor shortage gap. Finally, we're also taking a look at earnings from GameStop where we combine fundamentals and some of the meme stocks. Analysts here looking at revenue $1.1 billion on the bottom line, still a loss of about $40 million on the bottom line. Romain, back to you. Our thanks to Sophie, Ritika and Taylor. Up next, we break down the August U.S. jobs report with special contributor Larry Summers. That's coming up on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. From a standstill in 2020 when the COVID pandemic struck, the U.S. economy is in the middle of an historic comeback. The Biden plan produces results and the Biden plan is moving the country forward. We're now the first administration in history to add jobs every single month on our first six months in office. But while plenty of job openings are returning, many workers are not. For almost a year, the labor force participation rate 
It's a measure of the share of working age Americans who are employed or looking for work. That's been stuck near its lowest level since the 1970s. We lag all of our peers in labor force participation now, which is not where we want to be as a country. So where have all the workers gone? Some of the departed are baby boomers. Retirements in this group more than doubled in 2020 from the previous year. That's one reason companies say they are having trouble finding qualified workers. Another factor, automation. The adoption of technologies making some human jobs redundant predated the pandemic, but has since sped up. The pandemic also reversed progress in the fight against another epidemic that has been coursing through the U.S. workforce for decades, drugs. Deaths from drug overdose jumped 30% in 2020, about three quarters of the result from opioids. And critically, there's the issue of childcare. Many parents are expected to go back to work this month as schools do the same. But for women in particular, the resurgence of COVID with the Delta variant may complicate plans to rejoin the labor force setting back their recovery. We're in the middle of a fourth wave. We hope it will be short. But now that schools are opening without masks in some parts of the country and children are now the fastest growing cases of COVID cases, that matters. Schools opening matters for parents, particularly mothers, particularly low-wage mothers, to get back into work. And if that can't happen, the economy is going to slow. All right, here now with Larry Summers, of course, Bloomberg contributor, Harvard University professor, and former U.S. Treasury Secretary. Larry, we have to get to the news of the day, which is, of course, the latest payrolls data, 235,000 jobs created in the most recent month here. What's your general feeling right now about the pace uh, of the labor market recovery? Look, it was a disappointing number on the jobs. Uh, as best we can tell, I think this is due to... Uh, Delta and the fact that the economy's having some interruptions in uh, the ways in which things are uh, surging, surging back. So it's as much a supply side thing as it is a uh, demand side thing. It's not that employers don't want to hire. That's not what's holding down job growth. What's holding down job growth is, in many tech cases, they're having great difficulty finding uh, the people that they want to hire. Ultimately, my suspicion is that that's going to lead to more wage increases, more wage pressure. And from what I'm hearing, businesses aren't having a lot of difficulty passing uh, price increases uh, on. So I'm not sure that this report suggests less ground for concern mm -hmm. about inflation. It may, because of labor shortages, even suggest a little more uh, ground uh, for, uh, uh, for inflation. Well, let's talk about that supply of workers, because that clearly showed up in the data when you look at sort of the flat labor participation rate and you look at that big jump uh, in wages that we saw well above what most people were expecting here. And I'm wondering, as an economist, and you look at that, how do you find balance here, balancing getting more people into the workforce, particularly at a time where you are seeing employers uh, offer a lot more incentives, where, whether it's higher pay, bonuses, or other types of perks? I've been a big inflation worrier, as you know, uh, Romain. I think you got to be careful looking at the wage data. Mm -hmm. uh, the wage data aren't for the same worker every month. Uh, when a lot of higher paid workers come up, it looks like average wages are going, uh, going up. When uh, low paid workers surge into the labor force, it looks like average wages are going down. But that's not really a measure of wage uh, pressure. So I think we're going to have to be cautious interpreting the wage statistics. I do think that it's noteworthy that the participation rate didn't increase. There were a lot of people who were starting to think we were going to start to see more participation as we move towards fall, as some of the unemployment insurance, uh, ben very generous benefits uh, phased out. And I, I think that's suggesting that there's still a lot of hesitancy about uh, going back to work. I think the preponderant probability still is that we're going to be in a labor shortage economy for quite some time. And that's ultimately going to start feeding through into uh, rapid wages unless mm -hmm. businesses see all kinds of uh, adverse pressure on uh, their hiring, which uh, on, their, on their ability to sell their products 
which I don't yet see mm -hmm. uh, in the data. But it's certainly a moment of uh, elevated uncertainty. Well, let's talk about then the reaction function of the Fed. A week ago, of course, we were talking about Jay Powell's Jackson Hole speech. The idea here that that substantial further progress appears to have been met on the inflation side and that we were sort of on our way to potentially meeting that on the labor side. These folks are going to meet in less than three weeks. They are down in Washington for their latest policy meeting. A lot of folks think that they're going to talk about tapering and a specific timeline for tapering here. What's the conversation that they have to have in that room in about three weeks? my view, they should be stepping back a bit and saying in the current state of the economy, unemployment uh, reaching 5 percent, vacancies at record highs, quits at record highs, is this a moment when they want to be spending $1.2 trillion, uh, $120 billion a month buying uh, bonds in the midst of a housing boom like this? Should they be spending $40 billion a month uh, buying mortgage-backed uh, securities? So I think if you step back, uh, it's a little hard to justify the kind of QE they're engaged in. I'm not sure that's the conversation they're going to have. I think they're going to have a more incremental conversation, which says we're on a certain kind of path. We're doing things a certain way. Do we think that there's a compelling enough case that now's the moment when we should change our path? And because they're going to have a conversation that's so anchored in a current strategy, I think that's probably going to impart a bit of a bias towards uh, keeping on going. Um, and keeping things steady. Well, that brings us also to the fiscal policy equation, $4 trillion uh, of spending trying to work its way through Congress, $3.5 trillion of that. Uh, some senators, including Senator Joe Manchin, say should be put on pause right now, Larry. Yeah, look, I've got great respect for uh, Senator Manchin, and I think his general concern that we are at risk between fiscal and monetary policy of just overdoing things and overreacting in a way that we'll regret in several years in the same way that people regretted the comp combined uh, spending and monetary policies of the 1960s. Uh, I think Senator Manchin is right to have that concern in a very, very serious uh, mm -hmm. way. My own instinct, um, Rather than pausing the debate, which it seems to me is well teed up right now, is to translate that into making sure that new spending is paid for with genuine pay fors okay. in terms of uh, tax increases or increases in tax compliance, making sure that the tax payments are not backloaded relative to uh, the spending making sure that the spending is productive investment mm -hmm. in uh, the country's future, that is increasing the capacity of the economy uh, down uh, the road, and making sure that the spending is fully accounted for and spent out um, over a substantial uh, time period, rather than being front-loaded with the standard Washington budget gimmick of funding something that yeah. you know people are going to want to do permanently for only two or three years. So rather than pause the debate, mm -hmm. I'd sharpen the debate on making sure that we have the necessary kinds of control yeah. as we do the fiscal discipline. Well, some people are trying to sharpen that debate, and there was news this morning uh, before uh, we taped this, Larry, here, about uh, Democrats uh, in Congress uh, pushing uh, excise taxes, taxes on stock buybacks, taxes on executive compensation, uh, and a few other measures that are effectively uh, wealth taxes to a large degree here to help pay for some of these measures. Look, I, I think those things have to be sorted out on a very careful economic basis. Uh, I do worry about interest finance debt being used to uh, not make productive investments, but to uh, repurchase uh, stock. 
I do think that there are abuses in ways in which executives are paid uh, that enable them to escape taxes to a uh, substantial extent. Mm. I do hear stories about uh, Roth IRAs with billions of dollars in them and wonder what the hell is going going on and think that somebody ought to uh, close that down. But I don't think it's a helpful strategy mm -hmm. to simply frame it as all success should be tax criminalized. And so I think we need to find uh, the right kinds of balance uh, in, uh, in these things. But I think there is uh, more revenue to more revenue to be uh, found. Uh, yeah. To take another example, uh, if if I sell my house mm -hmm. uh, past a certain point, I'm going to have to pay capital gains tax. Why is it that if a multi-million, hundred million dollar real estate developer uh, wants to sell his property, he can do it through some kind of exchange and avoid capital gains taxes. There's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. that we should be going after. All right, Larry, always wonderful to get your thoughts here. Larry Summers, of course, Bloomberg contributor, Harvard professor, former U.S. Treasury Secretary. Coming up, David Rubenstein. He's not just a legend in private equity and a Bloomberg television host. He's also an accomplished author. In his new book, he makes a forceful case for immigration as an engine of economic growth. If we don't have uh, immigrants coming in, I think we're not going to have hard-charging, very smart entrepreneurial people. That's straight ahead on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Just give you a sense of the real-time action. The 10-year yield tumbling now 11 basis points. So continuing in this knee-jerk risk-off field. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm Romain Bostic. David Rubenstein has a lot of laurels he could rest on. He's the co-founder and co-chairman of the Carlyle Group, of course, one of the world's leading private equity firms, and he hosts not one but two programs on Bloomberg Television, Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversations and Bloomberg Wealth. But if that wasn't enough, he also writes books. His latest, it's called The American Experiment, Dialogues on a Dream. David Rubenstein joins me right now to talk about this book as well as other topics, and more importantly, David, to really, I guess, talk about this country and this experiment that we've had now in representative democracy, an experiment that has really been put to the test as of late. Yes, I think we had two stress tests in the recent per period of time. One stress test was COVID. Obviously, it structured uh, our country much differently in terms of health and so forth. And obviously, the stress test related to the election, presidential election, and the January 6th events. I would say we've been through many stress tests in our country, civil war being the most significant. But recently, the stress tests we've had have been significant, and they have, I think, changed the way the country is going to think about our government in the future. You start off this book with uh, that stress test, part particularly the stress test of the last election and, of course, uh, the attempt to, to effectively overturn the election with the January 6th storming of the Capitol. When Biden was inaugurated, he talked a lot about how American democracy really did prevail. It withstood that test. Do you see that? Yes. Um, what I try to say in the book is that this country, like all countries, has certain things that are make it significant, that are individual, diff different than other kinds of countries. What makes us different is certain genes, and I say there are 13 genes. Among them are the rule of law, the belief in equality, the belief in diversity, the belief in freedom of speech. Our belief in the rule of law and our belief in the uh, peaceful transfer of power are genes that I think overcame any other problems. And so in 65 cases, the judges basically threw out the complaints that were made against the election. And I think that wouldn't have happened necessarily in other countries. But there's such an ingrained sense in this country that the rule of law uh, is most important. And, and really, we need to have a peaceful transfer of power. And for that reason, I think we did pass these stress tests. But it's a lesson for the future. We have to be careful. A lot of people that you talked into this book are historians by profession, people who really do understand sort of what this country has been through from the 400 years or so from when it was effectively founded to the formal constitution that we had 230 years or so ago here. When you talk to those people and they sort of give you their perspective on where we've come, do they give you a sense here on just how lasting our democracy is going to be? 
I think historians tend to think the, the democracy is lasting, but they're always worried about certain things happening. One of the most interesting people I talked to in the book as a historian is Jill Lepore. Uh, she's a person who wrote a uh, history of our country over 400 years. She's the first woman to write a comprehensive history of our country in a textbook format, though it's really written more like a novel. And she's an obviously accomplished writer and a professor at Harvard. One of the most interesting interviews, I think, was David McCullough's. Mm -hmm. David McCullough is one of the most distinguished historians we've ever had, and he wrote about the Wright brothers. And people didn't realize at the time, I didn't realize until I read the book, that people in this country more or less rejected the Wright brothers, saying they were a little bit crazy. And it was, wasn't until they flew their plane in France that people actually began to pay attention to them. And there are entrepreneurs like that today who, I mean, people are, I mean, you take someone like an Elon Musk who was derided for quite some time with regards to his sort of efforts to bring uh, EVs and make a mass market EV vehicle and other sort of entrepreneurs out there who really came up with these sort of fanciful ideas. I mean, what sort of gets you from that stage of being the crazy person, you know, yelling at the cloud to actually being a success and having a successful product? Well, it's complicated. I do say that one of the genes our country has is entrepreneurship. We really value entrepreneurs probably more than other countries. Many other countries, if you're an entrepreneur, you're kind of cast aside. They think you're a little crazy. Here, we might think they're a little crazy, but we think if they become successful, we all of a sudden embrace their ideas. So Elon Musk, you cite, many people didn't think we could have electric cars at quite the pace that he's been able to build them. But look what he's done, and look what he's done on SpaceX. Mm -hmm. So. Everybody that builds a company uh, when nobody says you can do it is a little bit different because if you were just in the, in the mold of being like everybody else, you wouldn't have built the company. So every entrepreneur has some eccentricity, some drive, and mm -hmm. some personality quirks, but those are what makes those people successful. Your book talks about, of course, uh, the founding of our democracy and the sustainability of that democracy. It also touches a little bit, too, on capitalism itself, which, of course, underpins our democracy to a great degree. One of the interviews you had was with Booth Srinivasan, who wrote uh, basically a history of American-style capitalism here. What did you learn from him? Interesting. He's an immigrant to this country. But he yet wrote, I think, one of the best books ever on our uh, capitalist system, 400 years of American capitalism. Mm -hmm. And what he says is basically the capitalist system is really responsible for a lot of our, our growth in this country. Obviously, it is, because we value entrepreneurs, we value capitalists. And what he also points out is that a lot of these entrepreneurs failed, and they came back and they built successful companies after some failures. Also, we should recognize that the word capitalism is not in the Declaration of Independence. It's not in the Constitution. Mm -hmm. It's part of our DNA in many, many ways, but it really isn't part of any of the Founding Fathers' uh, documents or anything like that. They didn't really say we should be capitalists, but we evolved that way and became the most capitalist country of them all. I want to talk about immigration here. You spend some time in your book uh, talking about that. You interviewed Madeleine Albright, Aji uh, Lin Yang uh, as well. And you mentioned, of course, uh, Bush Shunravasan being an immigrant himself. Obviously, immigration is a big part of what made America, America. Well, your ancestors came uh, here involuntarily. Forced immigration, right. yes. Yeah. Uh, but people who came here voluntarily, uh, anybody could come in the early days. There, you didn't have passports, you didn't need visas, you just show up. Eventually, uh, when non-Western Europeans were starting to come, we began to say, wait a second, we're not going to have Western Europeans as much. Mm -hmm. So when people who were Jewish, people from Eastern Europe, people mm -hmm. from Asia began to show up, we began to have immigration laws that were very tough. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, we really didn't have a lot of immigration. We were theoretically a melting pot, mm -hmm. and we welcomed everybody, and there's a Statue of Liberty, but for a long time, we really didn't welcome a lot of people unless they were from Western Europe. We changed that. President Kennedy began the effort to do it. President Johnson got legislation through. And now we have a much better system. And we have now about 800,000 people becoming citizens each year. 91% mm -hmm. of the people who take the citizenship test passed it. Um, I'm not sure that many people who are native-born Americans could pass this yeah. test. In my book, I do put out. Finally, one more thought. Back to school equals back to work. It's basic arithmetic, or at least it should be, an equation worth remembering as more than 130,000 public and private schools across these United States reopen for the new semester. That's more than 60 million children slated to be at their desk in our nation's elementary and secondary institutions, or at least we hope. The past two school years have been a mess for students, teachers, and parents alike. First, there was the year truncated by pandemic lockdowns. And then that year that just ended this spring, it was largely virtual. Mounds of data out there showing the shortcomings and unevenness of a remote teaching process. But fall 2021, it was supposed to be different. It was supposed to be the grand return to classrooms, to in-person learning, to cafeteria lunches, to recess, 
outside with friends. It was also supposed to free millions of parents to finally make their way back to their workplaces, a return to office that was supposed to be the catalyst for breathing life back into dormant business districts and local economies. But what was promised for September still appears just ever so fleeting. The Delta variant has already hampered back to school plans for districts in Florida, Mississippi, Kentucky, Georgia, Indiana, South Carolina, and the culture war over vaccines and mask mandates. <laughs> That's certainly not helping matters. So here we are at the start of September, faced with the hard reality that our economy maybe is more than just a simple mathematical equation of production plus consumption. It's an ecosystem, a complex structure of interconnected elements that when you knit them together properly, leads to prosperity undeniably. But when parts of that fabric come undone, we would be remiss not to acknowledge how that dangling fraying edge affects the value and stability of everything else it's connected to. Schools aren't just institutions of learning. They are vital parts of our economic engine that when open and running smoothly, fuels retail spending, supports local food and cleaning businesses, and acts as de facto childcare for working parents. It's a balance, and right now, amidst this uneven economic recovery, our schools are one of the most critical parts of that balance.